Well, welcome to Questioning Christianity. My name is Dan Patterson, and this channel is all about helping you connect the Christian story to life's deepest questions. In this episode, we're going to be picking up on some controversial questions about the beginning of our universe, a question of the origin of human life, Adam and Eve in the Christian story, and how we piece together these big concepts of the truth through science and also what scripture teaches. My guest today is Dr. Joshua Swamidas. Uh, Josh is something called a computational biologist, I'm told, which he'll have to explain probably for all of us, as well as an associate professor of laboratory and genomic medicine at Washington University in St. Louis. He's got a ton of academic publications, of papers out there, but it's perhaps most well known in the Christian world because of his publication of The Genealogical Adam and Eve, which we're going to be talking about today. He runs a wonderful blog at peacefulscience.org where he really seeks to help foster a healthy conversation across differences amongst scientists in the hopes of getting better public engagement. And so, Josh, it's my honor to have you all on, on the channel today, mate. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to, it's great to see you again. We, we saw each other at ETS uh, recently, right? Uh, back in we November? did. We got yeah, to hang out. Did. Yes. We got to hang out in Texas, of all places. Uh, kind of uh, not, not exactly a whole lot going on in that particular city in San Antonio, but uh, definitely some good meat and great opportunity to get some conversations going. Uh, I had a blast. In fact, I was so impressed, mate, with your contribution there. There was a panel on uh, for four different views on the historical Adam and Eve. And then you were one of the respondents to the, the different views that were there. People like Bill Craig and Andrew Loke and Marcus Borg had all given presentations. And I just thought you did a great job offering some commentary on there. Sort of sparked, I'm like, I've been hoping to get Josh on the channel for a while. So it's great to have you on. Um, for our listeners who maybe have never come across you before, maybe take a couple of minutes just to spell out some of your own personal story and particularly what got you interested in the Adam and Eve conversation. Yeah, so I'm I'm a little ways away. I'm actually in the United States, not Australia. Yeah, uh, I'm a professor here. Uh, I'm, I'm a scientist, and I'm also a physician. Uh, so I have a medical degree and also a PhD in computer science, actually. But, so you're an um, underachiever, basically. Well, I mean, it means that I got stuck <laughs> in graduate school for my entire twenties. And I mean, I say computer science, but it's actually a lot closer to biology what I ended up doing. So I was okay. basically using artificial intelligence to solve problems in biology, chemistry, and medicine. And then that's basically what my group has been doing for the, my independent group has been doing for the last 15 years or so. And, um, you know, so I'm just a scientist uh, in the church, you know, a Christian in science. That's great. And how did you get interested in the Adam and Eve conversation across your life story? I think the question of Adam and Eve is something that a lot of Christians that are in the sciences really wonder about. Uh, it's something that that what we learn about in uh, you know about human origins in particular uh, in our coursework really seems at least on face value to be in real conflict with how a lot of us uh, have read scripture or and, and you know read to re I mean kind of raised to read scripture too. And it's not really clear um, how to fit that. And a lot of us have just been in tension. And I, I was no different than that. I, I was really just trying to figure out how to make sense of these two things. I mean, how, how does it all fit together? Um, can it all fit together? And uh, really wanting to be faithful to, uh, you know, a historical Christian faith. And at the same time, uh, really seeing a lot of legitimacy in science uh, and, and how it was thinking about things too. So it, it just had me uh, really kind of torn between those two. And so that's really common for Christians in science, but there's also a lot of people who um, have who felt that in different ways outside of science too. So, I mean, that, that's why this is a conversation that's bigger than just us as scientists. Yeah. Well, some of my sort of non-Christian friends, secular friends that are, are coming to this for the first time may be under the impression that when, when it comes to Christianity, there really is only one way of making sense of how to interpret the book of Genesis or this whole idea of where, to, where did humanity come from? Uh, could you give maybe a, a little bit of a window into the history of interpretation on this question and maybe some of the different views that are out there? Yeah, so this kind of gets to some of my biases here too. Where I mean, I think if it, if we if if it's really true what Christians say about Jesus rising from the dead and that being the way that God makes Himself known to all people that He's good, that He exists, and that He wants to be known, then um, then it starts to become you know important to see how we think about how that message was conveyed to us and 
And it's it's a little bit hard to believe for me, at least, that God did that and then somehow didn't uh, protect that message to us in history. I mean, it's a lot of work to then just kind of fumble a ball when it comes to, you know, conveying it to us. Hmm. And so for that reason, I mean, I'm, I'm really I really think that if Christianity is, is really worth um, engaging, it's the type of Christianity that's going to be worth engaging is something that's uh, aligned with historical Christianity. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, very much. And a lot of so, people. So it's not like Christians will believe something for 1900 years universally that will end up being entirely wrong. You should have some representation of that diversity or interpretation. Well, I mean, Christians are going to believe going things that are wrong way. all the time, right? Um, but it's not going to be something that we think is what God's message is to us, usually. Mm. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think, I think those are going to. I mean, and there are, there are things that, um, you know, for example, all the church fathers were wrong about. Um, and, we're, and we're pretty certain they were wrong. Um, so I'm not trying to say it's perfect, but it's also not stuff that kind of cuts to core things in our faith, right? And so mm. I'm, I'm really aligned towards that. Like, I mean, I mean, I, I, I've encountered Jesus. I really think he rose from the dead. Um, mm. But, uh, you know, you know, the type of Christianity I have is I'm trying to align the best I can with historical Christianity. What I mean is how the church of all believers, uh, you know, for the bulk of history has really, uh, you know, thought about key things. Mm. Not that it's always entirely correct. There can be discussion and, and negotiation across that, but that, that's kind of where I'm situated. And so sure. um, when you look at that ha history, then um, with these sorts of questions, it's really, it, I think it really turns out to be helpful to see the amount of diversity uh, through the church on how to think about Genesis. There's really quite a bit, uh, there's a big range. Um, I mean, I was raised as a young earth creationist. Um, when you go to the history of this, you find out that young earth creationism is actually really, really recent. Um, and that when you actually look at what the history is, it's it's actually a lot broader than that. There's a really mm. large range of views that were held about how to read Genesis. Mm. There was some things that were largely constant, but I would say a big part of the, the Genesis tradition is a mystery. Mm. And realizing that these are things that are important, but a lot of the details aren't clear and that is okay. It actually welcomes questions. Mm. I think that idea that Christians have options in the history of interpretation uh, is maybe one that's that's foreign to a lot of uh, outsiders to Christianity, but also for Christians. They may have been raised within a particular tradition where they've only received one of those as maybe being uh, possible or the best or the only explanation um, for all of that. And I remember it being interesting just myself reading the church fathers on this question of interpreting Genesis and realizing wow, they've, they've actually got a number of different perspectives, Athanasius and Irenaeus and Justin Martyr and Augustine. And you think, oh, okay, uh, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, you know, there wasn't know, just uniformity views, from the very beginning. And some views are going to be considered like heresy, right? But a lot of views, a much larger range than I th think most people appreciate, are, um, are within orthodoxy or considered faithful mm. heterodoxy. So there may be not the mm. dominant view, maybe everyone thinks it's wrong, but they still think people who are going down that path are doing so in a, in a faithful way. So we might call it mm. a faithful heterodoxy. And, yeah. and I think that that's a, good, that's a good type of diversity to hold on to. And part of what we have to do is not just think about what the right answer is, but also think about how we can have uh, how how we can have an approach and a view of these things that can tolerate and encourage uh, diversity. Hmm. And I think that kind of element of freedom to pursue the truth. I mean, if Christianity is true and God exists, then all truth is God's truth. And so the the freedom of thought to be able to say, how do I faithfully interpret scripture? How do I make sense of the record of, of nature, whether we're talking genetic record or historical record or, or these various pieces together uh, in, in the goal of being able to say, look, I, I, I want to be able to be free to follow the evidence. Uh, and, and so that's where often you get the disagreements amongst Christians and the different proposals on this question is that freedom desire to try and make sense of God's revelation, the literature of scripture, and interpret that faithfully alongside then interpreting the data of nature. Uh, but what matters ultimately in a conversation like this? So you've obviously waded in, you've, you've written your book. Um, why should we bother thinking about the historical Adam and Eve? What might be at stake? Well, let's first off point out that when it comes to the question of, uh, you know, the scientific account of origins, it's a lot of things. It's like the things like the Big Bang Theory, uh, the age of the universe, age of the earth, 
evolution of or the origin of life, the, 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 um, yeah. the evolution of plants and animals, and and then uh, uh, the origin of humans. It, it's worth kind of pulling back and asking, what's the, the real rub? Where is the point where there's really difficulty historically for Christians? Uh, it's really not the age of the earth. It's not the origin of life. I can give you a lot of reasons for that. Um, most Christians mm. just haven't really cared about that. Even if they thought mm. the earth was young because they didn't have evidence otherwise, it wasn't something they thought was really critical. Um, there is a large range of interpretations of Genesis 1, including those that take Genesis 1 days to be ordinary, you know, days of approximately 12 hours mm. that, um, you know, separated by a single night. Um, even those days really leave space for uh, a really ancient earth and, and earlier beginnings. So th th those, those just really have not really been the big challenge. The biggest challenge has always been uh, the, the, the origin of humans. And the reason why is it, it touches on core aspects of human identity. Mm. People have been really concerned about how we think of origins, uh, what certainly has had an impact on how we think about uh, you know, you know, human dignity and, and worth, <laughs> especially as you start kind of throwwing in the questions of race into this and, and, and the mm. origins has had a checkered history there. Mm. Um, and it also it also relates to things like eugenics <laughs> and, and people were, you know, legitimately worried about those things. And, you know, mm. are, and and then also when you look at, uh, at what uh, what scripture says, that's where you seem to see the biggest direct conflicts that um, mm. are not actually, uh, it seems, helped initially, at least by what historical views are. If you go before 150 years ago, just about everyone who read Genesis thought it was talking about, you know, you know, the origin of all humanity from from, uh, you know, you know, two individuals, a single pair. Yeah. And so how do you how do you make how do you make sense of that now if science is just telling us that 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 doesn't work? Mm. And, uh, and, you know, it's not just that that's what everyone thought. There was a lot of theology that seems to be communicated in Scripture, uh, particularly by Paul in Romans and in 1 Corinthians and Acts. And so, you know, this is the mm. same person who's like mapping out what the gospel is. Yeah. So if he could be, and he's connecting this to his understanding of the gospel too. So if he's really wrong about that, um, it's really going to the core of the Christian faith. It, it's not as important um, as the resurrection, to be clear. Like, I mean, I can be certain that Jesus rose from the dead and be uncertain about Adam and Eve. I could know mm. that Jesus is good and worth following and not really know what to make of Adam and Eve. But this is still sitting at a place that's really, um, that's really had a lot of Christians really worried for a long time and how to make sense of that. So some have really mm. just ended up, you know, rejecting evolutions on the ground. Um, it's interesting if you look at people, another famous Australian incidentally is Ken Ham. If you look at his reasoning on this, he's a young earth creationist who runs Answers in Genesis. Um, and if you look at his reasoning on why he thinks young earth creationism is important, it always emphasizes uh, Adam and Eve. And then the things like the age of the earth are actually, uh, in his argument, really just about a slippery slope to rejecting Adam and Eve, which then leads mm. to rejecting Jesus in his view. Mm. Now, there's a lot of Christians that reject Adam and Eve that don't reject Jesus. There's, um, I mean, they have to make some pretty big changes to their to the Christian theology. So, and also, you know, just because one isn't a young Christianist doesn't even mean one's rejecting a literal reading of Genesis. So he, he's wrong on a lot, but the key part that you can notice about his argument is that it really goes through, and the part where even people who uh, disagree with him on quite a bit will agree with him on this point, is that there is something actually really important going on about the th our theology of Adam. Mm. Particularly with things like, uh, what do we do with the nature of sin? And is there been a historical fall where humanity is no longer fulfilling or sending a right relationship to God, fulfilling our purposes intended? Uh, what that then means for the death and resurrection of Jesus and who needs forgiveness, uh, how we're made one in him, all, all of these sort of big questions that, that scripture seems to bring out. Um, so we've got these different views then. You, you've described young earth creationism and, and sort of Ken Ham of a young earth and a young humanity, especially created by God six to 10,000 years ago in the Garden of Eden. Uh, you've got sort of, sort of theistic, 
evolution uh, is kind of at the other end, which is God's directing the mechanisms of evolution towards developing bipedal hominids like us. And at either some point along the line, he sets apart a pair or a community or the story is written well, in a different way most um, to, to give them there. And then there's these other positions well, most, in the most, middle. But... Well, most theistic evolutionists have really rejected Adam and Eve. So most, most Christians that affirmed evolution, the vast majority, and they just said, you know, Adam and Eve isn't that important. Important. Those that affirm sure. Adam and Eve are theistic evolutionists generally don't yeah. think it's that important. Yeah. Um, so uh, that that's important about that that side of it. And, and I I kind of ended up in a bit of a more middle ground where I see a lot of legitimacy to uh, to evolutionary science. I really think that we arise with common ancestors of the great apes. But I also think that you know if we look at what scripture says and what the history of the church has been, there's probably some real importance to Adam and Eve, and that mm. things that are even things that people who are outside the church care about too. So uh, so I, I just don't think that we should be as quick to drop that. But it's yeah. probably worth me kind of pausing now and kind of explaining why, I mean, kind of what the big premise of my book is, right? Yeah. And yeah, I'd, I'd love to love to do that in a sec, because I reckon that's going to be really helpful for people to actually hear. What, what do you mean by uh, believing some degree in these evolutionary mechan mechanisms as, as well as uh, obviously preserving some of these these key features? Because for a lot of people, they may have heard as well that there are these different views, sort of the young earth, old earth, theistic evolution, um, and maybe considered that, you know, they're just the views. It's been a stalemate for 30 years. Nothing's absolutely changed. But the, the reality is the conversation has been changing quite significantly around this in the last decade with some new proposals. I mean, two of them were given at uh, ETS with Andrew Loke, uh, sort of the, the Asian philosopher, and then William Lane Craig, who, again, is wanting to adopt, uh, pretty happy to follow a common descent picture uh, of, of life here on Earth and of humanity, but still locate a historical atom 750,000 years in the past with Homo heidelbergensis. Um, but your perspective actually is quite novel. So I want to bring this up again. This is the genealogical Adam and Eve. Um, this is your book. Could you give us a window then into kind of the, the major idea uh, of what you're trying to do? And we may um, chuck up some slides here for you so that you can run that through as well. Yeah, let's see if I can uh, get over to those slides too on my computer. All right, there we go. All right. So we've been talking about, we're going to be talking about my book and the key idea that's here. And I've already kind of laid that out a little bit. There's a story of Adam and Eve in like some special garden. And that's saying that that's where, or, you know, how most Christians or most readers of Genesis have read it as like, you know, that's where we all come from versus the story of evolution and how do those fit together. So I, I think it's really important to pause for a moment and just explain what I mean by Adam and Eve and evolution. Mm -hmm. By Adam and Eve... Yeah, because there's many different ways to understand who Adam and Eve are, right? And uh, and I'm going to lay out, I think, with all the diversity that you see, you know, before about 150 years ago, just about everyone uh, who, uh, who read scripture, including atheists, would seem, would think that it's seeming to teach this, that it's a couple that was created without parents or novo created is another way to put it or you could also say specially yeah. created yeah and they lived fairly recently about ten thousand years ago and they're ancestors of us all of those three what's most important it's you can tell by looking into history of kind of what people really emphasize what they're okay negotiating away what they're not okay negotiating away mm. and um you know most christians haven't had that much difficulty um you know, get moving away from um, from you know de novo created, but um, but that that's that's one thing that's probably the least important. The next mm. most important is probably uh, when they were when they lived. A lot of people have been okay with them living a lot more ancient, uh, but the one that uh, probably is the most important is that they're ancestors of us all. And it gets to some uh, questions really about. Ostensibly on the surface, it's about things like original sin, but it, I think the concerns really are located on more about questions about the image of God, yes. and then and really, you know, you know whether or not we're really linked together in a common humanity or not, and what that would imply for you know human dignity and worth. Yeah, I think that's a big, big one to, to kind of uh, showcase there. And the kind of concern that people would have, I know, when they've heard different proposals is, you know, do I really know that everyone, all races within the human race that we see across the earth today really do carry the image of God, divine dignity and worth 
should be people that we open the door to inviting to know Jesus. Um, so yeah, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, so those, those are, that's what I mean by Adam and Eve. It's those three things. Three things. Yeah. About evolution, I just mean common ancestors with the great apes and that it appears that the human population never dipped down to just uh, uh, you know, a single couple. Our ancestors never go down to a single couple in the last 100,000 years or so. Now, um, you'll notice here, I didn't really talk about mechanisms. All I just mean is common ancestry. That means that if you go back far enough uh, in history, you'll, you'll find individuals that are our ancestors, you know, six million years ago, but are also ancestors of chimpanzees, apes, and bonobos. We could spend time debating about the Cambrian explosion and all that, but really that hasn't been a point of theological trouble for anyone. Mm. It's really been this question mm. about whether or not humans are connected to that tree of life. And um, that's also, I would say, where there's really strong evidence. I mean, as we sequence the human genome and then the chimpanzee genome and then the gorilla genome, that evidence has gotten to be very, very compelling. I'd say most Christian biologists really see that evidence and are convinced of it. That's not just biologists as a whole, but I mean, just a subset of biologists that are Christian, the vast majority really see strong evidence there. Mm. We're not talking about how the changes happen. So uh, this is not a claim that all of the mutations were totally random and God had no idea what was going to happen. Even if scientists say a mutation is random, that doesn't mean God didn't inspire it or providentially govern mm. it. So what I'd say mm. evolution is, if it's, if it's true, is that it's a providentially governed process mm. of common descent that gave rise to us mm. uh, because God wanted it to. So that's what I mean. Mm. So, so a lot of the theological objections there to evolution should just go away if that's all I mean by it. And that's all I mean. Now, if you look at these five things, uh, you'll notice that, um, well, I want you to notice, I guess, that really for 150 years, and this is where I think where my book ended up, ends up being a big change. For 150 years, just about everyone agreed that all five of these things can't be true at the same time, right? Yeah. And um, I was able to show how actually all five could be true. <laughs> so to give you a sense of what that means is that young earth creationists on one hand are saying that this is, you know, this is what Adam and Eve is. Yep. And it's obviously in conflict with evolution. That's why we reject evolution. And we think that Adam and Eve are real. <laughs> and they were created without parents less than 10,000 years ago, ancestors of us all. Yep. Atheists will say, yeah, we agree. Scripture seems to teach that, which is how we know scripture is wrong, because we have all this evidence of this other stuff <laughs> uh, in evolution. So you'll notice that even though they disagree entirely on so many things, they actually agree that these five things can't actually be held at once. Now, there's been a lot of people who have been kind of in a middle ground, people um, that are old earth creationists um, and, uh, and, and um, a minority of theistic evolutionists that have tried to negotiate away different parts of Adam and Eve. So they'll say, well, maybe they weren't an created, but they were chosen from a larger population, or maybe they were a lot more ancient. Um, or maybe they didn't have to be ancestors of us all. Mm. But they're still agreeing when they start to have those sorts of uh, those trades that they're agreeing that actually you can't have all five of these things. And of course, some Christians too that are faithful Christians, though um, many Christians would say that they're that they're wrong to make these changes, have said maybe Adam and Eve aren't, weren't really real people at all. And so they would reject Adam and Eve and find ways to still be Christian and kind of come to really affirm all, all of evolution. So th that's kind of where everyone's been. You'll see that the commonality that everyone has in this, um, no matter where they are, has been that you can't really have all five of these things at once, right? Mm. And my key uh, argument was that, you, you, that, in fact, you can have all of them. So how does that look? So um, as I kind of laid it out already, and this is just a visual way to kind of explain what, what I put. Uh, you kind of have Adam and Eve right there at the point, uh, right here, and yep. they kind of spread out across the globe, all their descendants. And that's what Genesis is telling us about. Um, and then when we get to the, the current theological era, which is, you know, after Jesus walks the earth, uh, I, I say 1 AD, but Jesus obviously, uh, you know, his ministry is much, much, well, not much later. It's mm. 
decades later from there so mm. 81 is just like an uh, is just like a it's a placeholder yeah. yeah it's a placeholder yeah really for where you know our current yeah. theological area era is this yeah. is like the era before jesus this is the era after jesus right for the for the historically literate who know when king herod died and jesus had to proceed that yes five to seven a.d like uh, bc likely when jesus was born but yeah it's a placeholder one a.d is a placeholder for everyone it's yeah. really speaking to like the current theological era versus the prior one before and yeah. after Jesus. And, um, and that, that's what the tradition is, but you'll notice there's a question mark because if you look through the tradition, you'll find out that while this part was generally agreed upon, there was an immense amount of mystery outside the garden about what God mm. had made there and what was going on out there. And if there were people out there, <laughs> yes. Now, one way to read that uh, is to just erase the question mark. And, 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 you know, you can do that. You can say that maybe, you know, Cain and, and Seth married their sisters, even though that's not actually what Scripture says. You could just kind of infer that. And um, because you're trying to tell a story that kind of says that God didn't make anyone outside the garden or anyone else alongside Adam and Eve. I mean, you can do that, but it's just important to recognize that that's, that's just one view that, you mm. know, that uh, that is certainly not what Scripture says. Uh, it's certainly not clear that that's what orthodoxy demands. Um, and it's a, essentially an assumption uh, that, that people are making and bringing into it. And while uh, there's a good case to be made that Adam and Eve are real and they exist, and those three things that I gave you from Scripture, it's a lot harder to uh, argue that there weren't uh, people outside the garden. So that gets yeah. to the solution I'm really proposing, is that I'm saying that God created people outside the garden, uh, you know, in the image of God. Now, some people might disagree with me on that. That's I mean, Andrew Locke would disagree, for example. But I'm saying that it probably makes most sense to see them as being in the image of God. So he would you, say there are people outside the garden, but they're not bearing God's image. Yeah, and he means that in a technical way, so we can talk about it. But I'd say it makes the most mm. sense to see them as an image of God. And then... Um, and these people yeah. have been created through the mechanisms of evolution. Exactly. That's how God created yeah. them. And then, uh, you know, at a later point um, in, the, in the fairly recent past, uh, even maybe as recent as 6,000 years ago, though, you know, probably a little bit more in the back, back behind that, like maybe, you know, eight to 9,000 years ago, but hey, it could have even been 6,000 years ago that they, um, that they are, they kind of spread out across the globe. And this first line is the point at which, you know, nearly everyone across the globe um, descends from them. And then a little bit farther down, you know, just, it just takes a few thousand years, it turns out, um, they would be genealogical ancestors of everyone. Uh, mm. And that means by the time we get to the current theological era, when Paul writes Romans, when Jesus gives the Sermon on the Mount and all these sorts of things, everyone that hears uh, the gospel and all of history <laughs> would have been people that descend from Adam and Eve. Now, of course, they would also descend from the people outside the garden. So it's kind of like, you know, this is our, our, our dad and these, this is our mom, <laughs> in a sense. You know, you, you have two lineages that go back. Um, mm -hmm. even as an individual, right? And in the same way here, you, we'd have, uh, we'd be descending from Adam and Eve, but we'd also be descending from the people outside the garden. Yeah. So in essence, and so when, up, when Paul, Paul and Paul in, let's say like Acts 17, for instance, then makes statements like from, from one man, he made all nations of men uh, and determined the times and borders to their inhabitation. He did this so that men may seek after him and find him, though he's not very far from any one of us. That sort of statement you're saying for Paul to make that there in the first century AD, that is true now because of this genealogical sort of ancestry. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's also important to point out that that says like all the nations, not all people were in nations even at that time. but. Um, that, that actually is an important thing because it's not really speaking about even the origin of our biological species, right? Which would have mm. happened a lot. Or it's really talking about the origin of civilization. Yeah, he's saying, sure. He's saying that the nations, I mean, nations are a very, very, very recent idea in the grand scheme of species. Our species arises, um, you know, 150 to 300,000 years in the past, depending on precisely where you draw the line. Yeah. There were not nations until... Um, you know, until the last 10,000 years. Um, at, sort of the at, agricultural at revolution. revolution. Yeah. And so, yeah. So, and so that's, if it's nations that matter, then 
you know, something more recent makes more sense. It, it doesn't say the biological kind of humans arose. Yeah. That's not what it's saying. Um, so, I mean, so the text actually really ends up helping us when we look at this. But, but let me kind of pull out and kind of give you the big picture of what I'm proposing here. That's I'm proposing that kind of like on the same ground reality that God creates, um, you know, all of our ancestors or most of our ancestors by a process of evolution. And then at a certain point, he creates Adam and Eve at a, in, in a divinely created garden. Um, and then they fall. and and all of those people outside the garden end up interbreeding eventually with Adam and Eve's lineage too, mm. and kind of entering into this fallen civilization. And so what you're seeing when you look at Genesis, it's describing the, this, this reality, but it's leaving out the details of what happened outside the garden, because that's not the most important thing for its mm. story. Its story is talking about, it really telling us about the first covenantal humans, the first that were there um, in the garden, uh, in God's extended intended state. And, uh, you know, maybe if they hadn't fallen, all of the people outside could have had an opportunity to enter the garden too, you know, mm. but they fell and, you know, they fell out of that covenant and that caused our current fallen state. You do see kind of hints blurry in the background of people outside the garden. People wondered about Cain's wife for thousands of years, for example. And creating uh, a city so quickly. Yeah. And where did yeah, all these sorts of things? And I, I mean, I, I detail a lot of these in my book in great detail. I mean, there's yeah. reasons why people have been asking questions about Genesis that have nothing to do with science in Genesis. Um, and really, all I'm asking people to do is to kind of remember that history and to re recover mm. that these historical readings of Genesis. Mm. So could I ask a couple of questions and, um, and quickly? Well, I want to explain just what's going on with science. Yeah, okay. and almost done. yeah. so the, the yep. thing here, though, is with, with evolution is that it's telling us a different story. It's the part that the evidence in genetics and our fossils really show, which is showing us the story of the people outside the garden. So both stories are really true. They're just, they're just telling us the different you know, sides of our origins. And so that's, yeah. that's the kind of resolution I'm proposing. Yeah. I mean, this is, I think, a really, really interesting resolution as well. And uh, I appreciate it massively. Um, uh, so a couple of questions that people may just have off the top of their head, some, some sort of biblical, some technical. Uh, so let's take a, a biblical one first. Um, so in that proposal where you've got humans existing outside the garden and Genesis paints this picture, there is this ordered space in which God sets his image bearers, Adam and Eve. Uh, he sort of created this order, but the, the world is wild, supposedly beyond the borders of Eden. I mean, the whole first command, be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth and rule over it kind of implies that that process of bringing order or cultivation is not yet complete in the world beyond Eden and to expand its borders of peace and cultivation and, and uh, all of that is, is kind of the intention of humanity from the beginning. So th that makes sense. Um, some people may say that, yeah, but you read Genesis 2 and it doesn't seem like there are other humans available because you've got that whole scene of Adam being created and then uh, God bringing animals to Adam but there was no partner suitable, no helper suitable for, for him. And so God has to specially create Eve. Um, do you just read that though? I've, I've had people ask me this in response to your proposal. Do you just read that as, well, God's bringing all the creatures from the garden to Adam to name them in that regard? Or what, what do you make of that sort of uh, question? Well, I mean, it's an interesting sort of argument because it's not based on the text of scripture. It just has to do how things seem. And, you know, we, all of us have preconceptions that we bring to, to scripture and, mm -hmm. and it can seem some way we tend to have like a confirmation bias. So, I mean, I, I, I totally believe it seems that way to them. The way to resolve this is to actually look at more people, <laughs> um, both more people now. It doesn't seem that way to me at all. Uh, I mean, it never really seemed that way to me. And I can point to the textual reasons why that is. That's the first thing. And then the second thing is that it's not because I'm some crazy evolutionist that is in the modern era. I can look in history and find out a lot of Christians long before evolution was proposed, long, long, long before it. Um, certainly within the last 500 years, it's really common. And then before that, um, if you go back, uh, you know, before 500, 500 years ago, thousands of years back, it's really, really common that people mm. are wondering what's going outside the garden. And so it didn't seem that way to a lot of people reading it. And so um, that's just an example where people kind of imported yeah. uh, ported, uh, some assumptions in. So why is it that people mm. have been wondering about this? It wasn't the challenge of evolution. 
actually that um, that was there. First of all, the first reason why is just the actual text. So many people, when they've read Genesis, for example, um, read Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 as sequential. First, Genesis 1 happens, and on day 6, God creates humanity across the globe. Uh, or humanity across the world. It doesn't really say globe in, in, in mm -hmm. Genesis, but, um, but that's how you can read Genesis 1. And then at a later point, and Genesis 2 happens, and that's where you see Adam and Eve being created. As to the question of saying, well, there was no one uh, there that was suitable for him. Well, I mean, it's talking about that area. It, the the mm. text goes to length to emphasize that there's borders to the guardian, uh, that the Rats is a large area, the Adama is a more, much smaller area within the Rats, and within the, the Adama is, is, you know, you know, within Eden is the garden. So mm. the garden doesn't even call, cover all of, all of Eden. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, uh, and then, you know, and later on in the next chapter, that's really critical to the story. Uh, it's being talked about in a very concrete sense because he, they, they are kicked out of the garden. They cross the border <laughs> of it yeah. and an angel is really placed there. Yeah, that made a lot of sense to me. And so, yeah, I just... <laughs> I think it's helpful to parse those out for people in their thinking, you know, as they've started to raise up these questions, how does this fit? How does this fit? And just see that, no, that you can fit a lot of these pieces together. I mean, it does make a lot of, a lot of sense. I mean, you can take it. I mean, like there are faithful Christians read a lot of this as mythological, right? So then you don't really think yeah. it's talking about a narrow area, but if you're going to read this in like a historical grammatical way and how, like I'd say how most Christians have read this, like it's just obviously talking about a small little narrow area in Genesis mm. two and Genesis one, seems to have a broader purview and uh, and many christians have thought not all but many have thought i mean i'm i'm convinced of this now too that genesis 1 kind of happened first and then genesis 2 happened i mean it's not the only way to read it to come to to, to something like the a genealogical adam and eve like andrew Loke disagrees with that and that's okay um and he comes to something like a, a genealogical adam and eve but um but but you know, it's it takes I think a lot of you know backflips to to read it in a different way, and so and I think that might be what's surprising for people is the the realization that your uh, hypothesis, your proposal, it, it actually has quite a straightforward reading of the book of Genesis that isn't really trying to introduce new ways of understanding it as a genre, uh, you know, something like Bill Craig's proposal of a mytho history. It has different interpretive rules then in how you come to uh, Genesis as, as genre. Uh, you also would say, well, you can actually have a pretty straightforward reading. And there are these yeah. problems that are introduced in the text, like the uncertainty of what's outside the garden and the who did Cain marry and what's up with these cities of people um, that can be quite easily slotted in uh in in a very unique way with what we know about uh our common ancestry questions as well that's re really interesting um this question we brought up before about the image of god um i think is probably maybe helpful just to parse out a little bit um because you talked about covenantal humans and some people uh in the past have interpreted the image of god to have to do with uh the p particular open door towards relationship with god or relating with god others have seen uh, so the image of there's god there's a history here there's a history that's helpful yeah. to know. So uh, if you go back 500 years ago, uh, the far bigger challenge to the Genesis story wasn't actually evolution. That was maybe like the straw that brought the camel's back. But it was really, um, it was really uh, the discovery of the new world. Uh, and, you know, as like the European colonial empires, you know, kind of expanded across the entire globe, um, to places like Australia and uh, to... Uh, to the United States, well, what is now the United the States. The Americas, Africa, yeah. Um, you know, there was big questions about where all those people came from, because this is one of the places where the church fathers were wrong. Um, most of them didn't really address it, but those that did were uniform in arguing that maybe there was another continent on the other side of the globe. I mean, maybe the, the Earth is a globe. That's not a problem. Maybe there's another continent on their side of the globe. That's not a problem either. They weren't flat earthers in that sense. But they said, you know, to the idea of there actually being people on those other continents, that would be totally contrary to scripture. <laughs> so Augustine puts this in City of God. So he was wrong about that. Um, and actually mm. the church, it was just kind of head in the sand about that possibility, didn't really see, have any evidence for it, and just really thought that that would be in conflict with scripture. Um, and the reason why is because those people on the other side of the globe wouldn't have descended from Adam and Eve. 
and then of course we discover that there are people there. And um, I mean, and that kind of really begins, uh, you know, a really complicated and messy history. Um, as mm. you know, we're all aware, uh, the conquistadors, when they're in, you know, when they when they come, you know, Cortez and his men, they say all these people over here, they don't actually really descend from Adam and Eve, and they're not really fully human, and they're not an image of God, and so we can do whatever we want with them. And so, uh, and people have said and done similar things with Aborigines in Australia and, and in Tasmania. Story. And Tasmania, and so that that's the history that we're grappling. With, right mm. now, you'll notice here that there was an assumption being made um, by Cortez that if people were not descended from Adam and Eve, then they wouldn't be in the image of God. They wouldn't be fully human and all that. <laughs> um, and so that's a, a an assumption that we that we kind of unaware kind of carry forwards from him and others like him <laughs> and i just reject that assumption to start out with because it, you don't find it anywhere in scripture and in fact if you read genesis in this sort of straightforward way that i'm proposing it tells you exactly the opposite because um if you read genesis 1 and i'm saying that's how god kind of creates people across the globe right um and it says, you know, and it's and that's actually where it says we're going to make them in our image, mm. male and female, and give them dominion over over all the earth. And so those people, if we're going to read Genesis one and two as sequential, um, then they're in the image of God too. And mm. so uh, there are people that God made to represent Him on earth. He wasn't in a covenant with them, but you know, God wasn't in the covenant with uh, Gentiles uh, before Jesus either. And that doesn't mean that they weren't in the image of God, didn't love and care of them. He's working out a plan to save them through, through Israel. And he also, uh, he also was in relationships with God fearers too. Mm. I think there's probably something really similar going on with people outside the garden. And, you know, I think you can even understand Adam's original purpose wasn't to come and spread sin, but to actually offer the people outside the garden an opportunity to enter in the garden. And so that God mm. had a purpose and, and cared for them and wanted to be in relationship with them. But he was doing his common pattern that we can not like, we can disagree with, yet this is what he did of kind of working through, you know, Abraham, of working through individuals that he chose for particular reasons and kind of raised up for particular purposes to kind of work out his salvation plan. Mm. I mean, it is scandalous that he does it that way. It's called yeah. the scandal of particularity. But but yeah. that's that's like deeply, you know, baked into our faith <laughs> as it is. So yeah. it's not anything new. And so I really like that. that. With, a, with something that's actually just really coherent with the rest of the faith. Yeah, I really like that about your proposal is the way it universalizes humanity in that regard, rather than creating this up until this particular point, no, not human, and therefore no opportunity to enter into relationship with God, but all anatomical humans, all rational creatures in that sense have that uh, opportunity to be able to do it. Um, I, I really yeah, there's also, that, there's that also debate thing. about what the image of God is, too, right? So different Christians massively think about that. And yeah. what, what I'm proposing actually kind of makes space for all those different views, maybe gives some different ways to think about it, uh, how they could fit together, too. Yeah, uh, so uh, it, it maybe even gives, uh, you know, uh, the, being conformed to the image of Christ, for instance, uh, it's like the bringing together of these various features. It's the moral character of God. It could be the calling of God in stewarding creation as gardeners and governors. It could be this relational component of relating to God in a certain way. Um, so you could say there's some features of yeah, image of God that all, all people have shared, but then Adam and Eve's creation adds this new mission or purpose in the world. There's just, uh, it opens up a number of doors to bring these things together, which I feel yeah. helpful. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot to talk about the image of God. I mean, a lot of us, I mean, so I mean, we're in Black History Month right now. And um, and so I'm often thinking about Martha Luther King Jr., um, who uh, I, I have a lot of, of respect for and, you know, wish he was still alive today. But um, he would say things like, you know, there's no gradations in the image of God. We're all fully in the image of God. Well, it's important to actually know that um, that's not ever said anywhere in Scripture, mm. and um, and we can still have a very robust um, affirmation of our equal worth and dignity in God's eyes. One, and, and come to, I mean, just different views. A great example of this is how Eastern Orthodox have thought about it. They have often said that, you know, we're none of us are fully in the image of God. The only one that's fully in the image of God is Jesus, and we're all becoming mm. in the image of God. Mm. Yeah, and uh, that 
has not historically uh, been a view that has degraded human worth or been support for slavery or whatever. It actually maybe uh, takes hold of the reality that, you know, we're not actually fully there. So people who are in the image of God can do things as horrible as slavery to one another. Mm. Um, and, you know, Martin Luther, too, uh, you know, the, you know, the founder of Protestantism or the one who kicks that off, uh, the Lutheran, I. Uh, in the Lutheran namesake, he he wasn't really convinced that we were all in the image of God. Now, I mean, I think that we all are in the image of God, but I just think there's also diversity there. The part mm -hmm. that we should all be convinced of is that everyone across the globe that we've encountered, including uh, including you know Tasmanians and Aborigines and all of the indigenous people, they have equal worth and dignity mm -hmm. as us. Even if we were to find out that science told us that they didn't descend from Adam and Eve, I think we can be very certain that's the case. Um, yeah. But the fact of the matter is, of course, that our best estimates in science are is that even the Aborigines and the Tasmanians would be ancestors of Adam and Eve if Adam and Eve really, really were real people in a real past. Yeah, so that was actually my next question. So um, your book, The Genealogical Adam and Eve, is a very specifically chosen title because um, let's say the common descent idea is that we have genetic ancestry uh, with the, the great apes. So you go all the way back and we've got a common ancestor that splits off the, the tree of life. And so we, we're all connected from that point onwards. Um, genealogical ancestry is not the same thing necessarily as genetic ancestry. And so uh, one of the things that I think a lot of people would say, well, well if you're talking a few thousand years, supposedly, is let's say 8,000 years ago, well, wasn't everything connected by land bridges way before that? And didn't the indigenous Australians split off 60,000 years ago? How is it possible that genealogically we, we share common ancestors back. Could you just explain both the, the difference between genetic and genealogical ancestry, but particularly then how, how can it possibly have gotten all the way to Tasmania? Uh, the sort of the questions that people have, how did indigenous populations in the Americas and Australia get connected back? Well, there's, there's a lot of stuff that you're raising here. So let me break it up. So first of all, the cool. difference between genetic and genealogical ancestry, is, it, and it ends up being really key. Um, so genealogical ancestry is an ordinary understanding of ancestry that doesn't require scientific knowledge. In science, we kind of refer to it sometimes as a pedigree, um, but mm -hmm. it's really simple. It's just the idea of you know biological organisms giving rise by reproduction to new organisms. You talk about parents and, and children, you know, and you know grandparents and all that. When you talk about that, that's an ordinary answer. It doesn't take scientific knowledge. People have been talking about that for a long time. Yeah. And people thought. So that, that would that be like the biblical understanding, technically. So when they do genealogies through there, they're thinking descent from this sort of family line. Well, I would say a better way to put it is, uh, you know, kind of lined with the Chicago statements on inerrancy, is that scripture speaking in ordinary language, mm. and genealogical ancestry is ordinary language. So. Yeah. So that this is the biblical language, but we're using it outside of the Bible all the time. You know? Yeah. Um, genetics is very different. It's a very new way of looking at ancestry. That's more about uh, the history of little pieces of DNA. And so um, it, that does track somewhat in when you're dealing with your very close neighborhood of genealogical ancestors, like you can do sibling tests, and ancestry yeah. tests. But it really quickly falls apart. Like you know, these sorts of paternity tests uh, fail after uh, about you know ten to fifteen generations. We, you just don't get enough DNA from most of your ancestors going that back. That the chances that they'll work just go very, very to be very, very low. Sure. Um, and so it just kind of leads to this weird paradox that's um, you know well accepted and true is that you know you go back a couple thousand years, um, almost everyone alive, um, except for those that don't actually leave any ancestors at all. Um, are ancestors of everyone alive today. <laughs> but That's a also, crazy uh, concept. We get DNA for most of them. So it's both, they're not our genetic ancestors, but they are our genealogical ancestors. Mm. That's the, well, mainly, I mean, mostly not our genetic ancestors. There'll be a couple lottery winners that are, but most of them aren't. And that, that, that's a weird paradox that takes a long mm. time for people, I think, to get their heads around. Mm. So you, you might say in our family line, we can all just say that we descend from a pharaoh somewhere or that we descend from a king or queen somewhere. But, but, but what you would say is there's no real reason we should expect to see genetic evidence were you to do a DNA sequencing of me, for instance. Uh, and I think that answers a common well, question. Like, is, there, is there, yeah, but there's, there's, let's say, is there, let's say your proposal is 
correct. And uh, there's a real Adam and Eve created by God in the garden six to six to eight thousand years ago. Uh, we shouldn't expect to see necessarily yeah, any genetic information of superhumans or different kinds of humans or anything like that within our genome. Yeah, so this is actually ends up being really surprising, right? So it turns out that we don't have really any DNA to judge whether or not Adam and Eve were de novo created. And, you know, there's even good reasons to think that God wanted to create them in a way that was reproductively compatible with the people outside, in which case mm. we wouldn't see any evidence mm. of it. And so there's really no evidence either way from science about whether or not they were de novo created. So kind of like the mm. default view in the Christian faith, maybe it was true. Maybe God really did create them. Uh, without parents of their own, mm. and so there's so that really second mechanism to change that. <laughs> yeah, but that that second mechanism idea, which I really uh, found fascinating, reading a few chapters into your book uh, around uh, just computing how many generations does it take, how long does it take for all of humanity to have those shared genealogical ancestors? Just want to walk us through that quickly. Yeah, so I mean, I, I go this in over this in detail, but. Um, yeah, uh, th this has actually been pretty well studied in um, in academia, and we have just like I said, the, the best estimates are that you know if Adam and Eve exists, we would all descend from Adam and Eve. Um, I at contributed a little bit to that, explain kind of what that was, but the big question that always comes up is what about Australia and uh, and uh, the Andaman Islands, which are right near there too, right, and Tasmania, right. Yeah. So uh, there's a couple of patterns. So let's start with the Andaman Islands. Um, so we, we have gotten genetic information from them. We also know a little bit about history. It was actually, uh, you know, a call of, of the British for a little while. And it has this myth associated with it. Um, John Chow was a uh, was a was an American kid, a, a bit naive, but certainly well-meaning that went to try to share the gospel to these people in the Andaman Islands because he'd heard that they'd in, never been in contact with uh, civilization for 50,000 years. Mm -hmm. um, and that was reported widely in the media, and uh, and he was killed when he went there because they didn't like um, people from you know civilization. Well, as it turns out, like I said, we know from history that actually they did have a lot of contact with the British. That might be why they don't like us right now. <laughs> uh, and also, when we've gotten um, you know genetic samples, we found out that in fact they have been interbreeding with their neighbors. So the idea of them being genetically isolated for 50,000 years just isn't reality. Mm. It, uh, it's just not that. And, I, and there's been several cases, uh, uh, you know, you can look at the Amazonian rainforest and the people there, we just know that they've been interbreeding. Um, and it, I mean, one of the more interesting things is that they found Australian DNA in, uh, in indigenous people in the Amazon forest, deep in the Amazon wow. forest that people were just completely confused by what's going on is we finding over and over and over again that there's been a lot more exchange of mm. DNA uh, with our ancestors in the past. Like we've kind of had a naive view that they were all kind of staying like as home bodies in their own area. But in fact, we see long range migrations all the time, just like constantly, wherever we have data, we see that. And whenever they go to and, new and places, trade yeah. trade routes and, and yeah. ships, they, you know, they're taking boat over to different trade from island to island. And yeah. Yeah, so there's still questions, though, about Australia, right? Um, and so one of the things that really surprised me about this is it's true that around 60,000 years ago, um, you know, that's when Australia was first populated. But there's other things that I found out that I didn't know at first. It turns out that um, the land bridge actually never went all the way from South Asia to Australia. There was always about a 100-kilometer gap that had to be crossed with boats. and um, and you know Neanderthals never made it to to and Denisovans they never made it to Australia. And the thought is is that you know boating technology, uh, you know, sufficiently advanced and you know with enough forethought was a unique ability of Homo sapiens. <laughs> that when mm -hmm. Homo sapiens came to South Asia, that's when they first started to cross over. <laughs> And so um, that that's like a really big realization that actually, whoa, wait a minute, there was boats that far back, you know, 60,000 years ago, there was boats. Um, we're nearly certain of that. Mm. And, um, and that was necessary to colonize um, Australia. The other thing that we found out is that there was, uh, you know, boats start to become fairly common, <laughs> you know, about, you know, 80,000 years ago. Um, and uh, there's pretty good evidence that the that the dingoes of Australia arose um, 
you know, long after 60,000 years ago, probably within the last 6,000 years or so. Um, and they might have come off of uh, on boats from, you know, from dogs that came on boats from India about 4,000 years wow. ago. Um, and so that's, uh, that, that, I mean, like, once again, that's just completely, um, you know, surprising, right? We, we don't have mm. any records of those boats from India. But the reason why we think that happened is because both the dingoes kind of appear suddenly about that time. <laughs> um, and also because uh, there's a big influx of Indian DNA into uh, Aborigines at about that time. Sure. And if there was a big thing influx, discoveries. Yeah. And this is all from genetics and ancient DNA. If you if you have um, you know a big influx four thousand years ago, there's going to be other influxes that are too small, you know, around those times. Like people certainly, and you know, in that time period, you know, from you know, I mean, just commonly had the ability to to cross large seas, and so the idea that it's not so much about whether or not Aborig Aborigines had boats to get anywhere; it's really about where the rest of the world had boats to get to Australia. Mm. Yeah, and they totally. certainly did. And whether or not the rest of the world had boats to get to uh, Tasmania, and they certainly did. Um, yeah. So, um, so when you start to see this, you just find out that a lot of our views about the past have been really naive. We thought, mm. um, you know, for 500 years when we first encountered Aborigines and America's like, oh, these people, they, they're, uh, they've been isolated here. They're back in the Stone Ages. That's actually not true. They weren't in the Stone Ages. They, they had agriculture in a way that was not common in the Stone Ages. <laughs> And they they had nations too. They had large mm. tribes in a way that wasn't common in the in the in the Stone Ages, mm. as far as we can tell. Mm. Uh, and some of them did only have oral cultures, uh, like the Aborigines. But oral cultures are a lot more sophisticated than we thought too. Mm. And so they they really, I mean, our best estimates are that they would descend with common ancestors, a few of them, even though they're they were uh, they were. Uh, largely i you could say they were largely isolated but they weren't totally isolated so the right view of them is not that they were these totally isolated you know appendages of the human race they really are the same race as us they're the same blood we share uh, common ancestry with them in the relatively recent past um, and it's a mistake to see them as a different you know subspecies or that different Which, that, that's just not true they're the same race yeah. as us. they're the same family yeah, as us. yeah. And hopefully that will lead to, I mean, there's still a lot of reconciliation work that needs to happen into the future. And so those sorts of views and in discoveries can just have a really powerful role in fostering a shared humanity. Um, yeah, I, I've got a big question um, that kind of, oh, I know a lot of people who maybe more from the Christian side might have reading a proposal. And that's how do we make sense of the notion that uh, it seems to be outside the garden then, or even prior to the creation of Adam and Eve, you've got so much death, even in a human population. Uh, a lot of Christians who would particularly come from a young earth creationist perspective would want to hold that there is no concept of at least human death prior to Adam and Eve's fall in the garden. And so it just seems like this would be a very, very new reality to have to wrestle with. Have you done much in the way of trying to make sense of uh, theodicy or explaining why would a good God uh, use these sort of pattern of things, uh, Adam and Eve and, and death's entrance into the world? What do you make of that? Yeah. So my book, um, chapter 14, I goes through and kind of and, you know, 15 and 16, too, they really look at the fall and kind of go into those questions in real depth. So if you really want to know my view, you'd go there. But um, just on a Good surface point. level right now, I just say that, yeah, it's true. There's a lot of death in the past. but There's also a lot of life and joy. And I don't think a real fair accounting of that is going to uh, neglect that it's really both those things in the past. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that, um, that uh, to point out that death and suffering are not the same thing. Death can often be the end of suffering. So um, death can also be the end of a lot of evil activity. So there can be a lot of good in death in a world that isn't fully morally perfect. And God had every right to make a world that wasn't morally perfect, but also had temporary beings in it. And uh, there are goods that arise out of that wouldn't arise otherwise. One of those goods is that there's a lot more diversity and beauty in the history of the world than if God had just made a world that was um, just 6,000 years ago and there wasn't that type of death. I mean, and I think most of us know that. Um, even young earth creationists, when they look at 
the fossil record. They see great beauty. Uh, when they see uh, they see the the Grand Canyon, they look at it and they're awestruck by the power and beauty of what God has made. They don't sit there going. I mean, I've just never seen a young earth, even a young earth creationist that's looking at all this and is just mourning the death of all these animals, and is mourning Adam's sin that caused the 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 you know the Grand Canyon. Now they might be mourning other things because of Adam's sin. <laughs> But you know, but you know, they're not usually mourning animal death as they're you know eating their hamburger. So there's like these weird inconsistencies that, that just show that that's not even really kind of what's written on our hearts. We know that that there's something beautiful and grand about life's history, even though there is death in it, and even though death is what gives us a view into it. I and mean, be fossils that animals never died, mm. um, and and that's 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 just. The beauty of God's good world. He was he had so much creativity and lavishness that um, he couldn't fit it all on Earth at the same time. <laughs> uh, and which, so, he, which helps to give some kind of response, you know, when people say that ninety nine percent of all of the different species that have ever existed are now extinct. Um, that's not yeah. responding to that. Well, yeah, and and that yeah. just means like that. Well, I mean, I think one thing that you find out. I mean, if you're old Earth creationist, or if you think the Earth is old, like I do. I mean, I think evolution is true too. So. I mean, but old earth creation is kind of broadened now to include that view. Well, you know, one thing you have to really walk away with, well, is God didn't create all of this for us. <laughs> he was doing it for, for himself and for, mm. for other things. Like, you know, he was taking joy in it long before we were here. Now, of course, you can mm. still say that we're the pinnacle or we're at least the end of the story that, that begins in Genesis 1. God has a person and loves us. He, uh, we're the only ones that we know about that God created in his image on earth. But he was, he was enjoying this beauty long before we arose. Mm. And so that just yeah. kind of points us to a bigger God. If, if people are looking for maybe a, a quick little intro into this broad conversation, we actually created this video on our channel. Uh, when did God create dinosaurs? Or we just spell out the different views, but I mean, I love dinosaurs. I've been fascinated by them. You sort of yeah, ask You love my uh, son, Caleb. He's eight years old. He loves dinos too. And yeah, so yeah. He asked me, like, sort asked of that... me, were dinos in scripture? I told him they, were the, they weren't made yeah. a long time ago outside the garden. Yeah. He's like, oh, okay. <laughs> and it's just part of that reality that, well, God just delighted in these big creatures. You know, yeah. God loves... Uh, being able to enjoy them at the time in which he, he brought them on the earth. They weren't there for us. We get to discover their fossilized remains, but uh, but that's about it. I made a lot of this um, conversation uh, so often focuses on the first three chapters of Genesis, maybe um, uh, sort of Cain and Abel stories from there. But uh, your reading, obviously, g given that it gives quite a straightforward uh, take on Genesis. What, what do you make of those later parts of the proto-history or Genesis 1 to yeah, 11, I, I, things I, I, like Noah's flood? Yeah, I'd say I, I think it's just some, if we're going to read it literally, um, we should read it literally and not just deviate from that to benefit, you know, a preconception such as young earth creation. So um, when I read Genesis, it talks about how all flesh on the aret or the world as it somehow is translated or the earth as it somehow translated um, was destroyed. But, you know, if you look at that actual term, aret, it doesn't actually mean the globe of the earth. It doesn't mean planet earth. They didn't know um, at that early date about planet earth. It's not talking about that. And um, in the Genesis text itself, it talks about the Arets and the lands beyond the Arets as well. So there's this point, you know, Arets is just, a, you know, potentially large, but it's still just a, re a region. Mm. And if you're gonna read it literally, I mean, I mean, obviously it shouldn't be, I mean, I, I would hope that we understand, most of us do, that it's not supposed to be a rigid reading of an English translation. I mean, mm. it comes to us yeah. in Hebrew. So what does the Hebrew say? And how did they mean it? And mm. it just doesn't mean a worldwide flood. I mean, maybe um, the Americas were covered by a flood. I mean, that's not in contradiction with it, but that's certainly not what it's teaching. And so with that, um, you know, we should be free to look at the evidence and the evidence, uh, the only people who think that the evidence indicates that Noah's flood covered the Americas and caused the Grand Canyon are people who are convinced that that's what scripture clearly teaches. But if we let go of that, then um, I'm not aware of anyone who thinks that. <laughs> um, so, um, so then, you know, it's not really, I mean, I think, I think it's pretty clear from an evidential point of view based on that, uh, you know, the evidence doesn't really point that direction, but there's really no reason and scripture us for us to insist on that. 
You mm-hmm. can go farther and see like the Tower of Babel. Um, there's some really excellent work that's been that's shown that really connects that in a very plausible way to um, you know the proliferation of ziggurats uh, in the Middle East and how that was going on. So what they're saying is that you know people made a gigantic ziggurat and were trying to say they had something to offer God and calling him to kind of come down from heaven to sit down on their thing, like everyone else was doing around them. Uh, and uh, God was like offended by that. He's like, I'm not trying to create like this little, little cult to me here in this one little narrow area by creating, um, you know, covenantal humans. I want you to actually go to the entire world. And mm-hmm. so he spreads them. And it doesn't actually ever say that this is how the first languages arose. It never says mm-hmm. that's the origin of all languages. It just says he confused their language. <laughs> So they, so that the the people he's talking about there, which are the descendants of Adam in that area that weren't obedient to spread, um, so you know that they were spread out by confusing their languages. And also, you know, if you look at how, um, you know, the the analog of this in the New Testament is in Acts one, where you see tongues coming, and that's supposed to be a very close analog of uh, of uh, the, the Tower of Babel, and so that gives us some insight into this too. It wasn't so much that people spoke in a different language as much as people heard in a different language. Mm, yeah, they heard it in their own language, even though it was Peter talking. They heard it in their own language. Mm. I mean, and that, that once again, I think that's important because what's going on here is that God wanted His plan to kind of spread across the entire world, and He was facilitating that plan. And it, He didn't have to make other types of languages because that was naturally happening. But He might have had to kind of take the, His like stubborn followers. <laughs> And get them to actually go out and move across the earth and kind of force them to start speaking in different languages. So it starts mm. to make a lot more sense that way. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So and you can go through the you... whole you can go through the whole thing and and you just take a very literal reading. Like I say, like what I think was very, I would say, encouraging to me. I think there can be debate for some long Christians about how literal to read Genesis. But um but this is a more literal reading than young earth creationism, certainly more literal than the readings that I that I had growing up. And and that should really, uh, that should really, um, you know, give us, well, you know, and that should, I mean, it really does defang, I would say, much of the origins debate. It really reorients it. This isn't about whether or not you're going to read Genesis literally or not. It's really mm-hmm. about whether, uh, you know, you know, if you're saying it literally, you want to read it literally, will you read it literally? Mm-hmm. And, you know, and then can you see that there's legitimacy in evolutionary science, which I think most Christians do see that. So then this gives us a way to make sense of it. Mm. And I think that's kind of the interesting feature, as I said uh, a bit before, maybe even the last 10, 15 years, is you are starting to see various proposals that are being put out there to try and make sense of the data of scripture as well as the the, the record of nature. And I, I think yours is maybe the most novel that I've, I've come across today, um, to date, sorry, and uh, and certainly found it really interesting and helpful to dive into and to ask these sorts of questions. Um, I mean, your contribution to the panel on four views of the historical Adam at uh, the Evangelical Theological Society uh, last year, uh, one of the things I just appreciated was that you brought up the Lausanne Covenant, which is this wonderful theological document from uh, the last hundred years back in the, the 70s. It was penned by John Stott and other evangelical leaders uh, able to sign on to this. And it was meant to be an expression of what are the things that really matter and not just what do we believe but how should that orient us in our responsibility and, and kind of mission in the world uh, what are you hoping to see happen in this conversation in the years to come you know as christians continue to wrestle with how do we understand adam and eve how do we make make sense of the uh, sort of scientific record of, uh, of our origin story um, what do you hope is going to happen where this has been a place obviously where there has been a lot of disagreement and sometimes quite strong language used in those disagreements, denouncing one another for holding different perspectives? Um, yeah, what, what encouragements would you give to people who say, look, uh, Christians who disagree with me are either misguided or entirely compromising on the Bible? Like, uh, um, any wisdom? Well, yeah, so I, I think in origin specifically, I hope. And I think we can already see this happening is that um, or, the origins debate, that ugly war is just replaced with, um, you know, a beautiful exchange between Christians that sometimes disagree, but are engaged in good science, uh, even along non-Christians. And it's just becoming, you know, a really enjoyable conversation that we want to be part of. That, 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 that's what I think I'd, I'd like to see happen. Um, mm-hmm. And it can happen. It's already starting to happen in a lot of ways. And it's really cool to see that. Um, 
And I, and I think with that, I think we're able to do that because it's a lot more defanged. I mean, we're not actually dealing with things that are actually central to the Christian faith or even close to the center of the Christian faith. Uh, we're dealing with things that are that have always been disagreed by about by Christians, right? And so that, I think, kind of gives us permission uh, to do something that I hope and happens more broadly than just origins. I think um, in the current moment, um, some people in the church have really been threatened and, um, and responded to different threats by taking a more fundamentalist approach to disagreements and diversity. And it's a, the fundamentalist instinct, um, which you'll even see among non-fundamentalists, to be clear. You'll see it among the liberals, too. <laughs> The fundamentalist instinct really tries to deals with dis, disagreement by you know just becoming more doctrinally rigid, and you know starting to execute litmus tests and you know narrowing the boundaries and focusing on purity, you know doctrinal purity. You know the thing about the the church, the whole church. You know the Lausanne Covenant's refrain is like you know the whole church bringing the whole gospel to the whole world. <laughs> If that's what our task is, uh, then we have to confront the very, frankly, uncomfortable reality that the church is really diverse. Like, God is reaching out to people that are very different than us, and many of them are coming and choosing to follow him. And they're entering the church, which is our family, <laughs> with very different starting points than us. And because of that, we have a lot of disagreements. And so that fundamentalist approach ends up being fun, I mean, you know, fundamentally, like at its core, working against the work of God to have the whole church declare the whole gospel to the whole to the whole world. That, that's the fundamental problem with fundamentalism. <laughs> that's the core of it. And what we need is something better. Um, we need a Lausanne covenant sort of evangelicalism. Um, sometimes evangelicalism is just equated with fundamentalism because it sometimes seems that fundamentalists are just acting like fundamentalists <laughs> in this regard. But we have a better instinct. That instinct is the evangelical instinct that um, that I really hope is recovered, not just in origins, but also in our conversations about race, about mm -hmm. politics, about um, you know about foreign affairs in the Middle East, what's going on in the Gaza war. We have to understand that God cares. Uh, I mean, God just does that really bewildering, wild thing of bringing people that disagree into the same global church. And that's the beautiful mm -hmm. thing. That's why we should have confidence that it is really God doing it, because it's like a bigger vision for diversity um, mm -hmm. than, frankly, most of us are prepared for. Mm. And even though we're really prepared for it, honestly, find it uncomfortable, right? <laughs> mm. Yeah, I really love that, mate. And just the idea that, you know, scripture is given to us as a spiritual curriculum to help us become wise under salvation and to become the kind of humans that can rule and reign alongside Jesus in the new creation. And so just learning to sit amongst disagreement and have meaningful conversations that are shaped by intellectual and moral virtues of being able to disagree well uh, is just going to help us become more, more like Christ uh, in the future to come. Uh, thanks so much for your time, mate. Uh, for, for those, again, this is Josh's book, The Genealogical Adam and Eve. It's such a interesting read to be able to try and wrestle with this big conversation around human origins and Adam and Eve and our common humanity. Um, please do pick up a copy and check that out. Uh, you can go and see a lot of the projects that Josh is involved with at peacefulscience.org. Um, great articles and just advocacy for bringing together a better understanding of science uh, and kind of the, the implications for that for um, religious believers as well. One of the curious things you'll find about both Josh's proposal and his website is just the number of people who don't even believe in God and aren't Christians and yet give glowing recommendations of both the science and the measured conclusions that he draws across it. So it's, it's really worth checking out. Um, Josh, if you were to give a parting message to anyone who's considering Christianity, what might that be? Yeah, I mean, if you're if you're considering Christianity, just look at who Jesus is. Even if the church doesn't always make sense to you, or Christians kind of annoy you at times. Frankly, let, let me just be honest: Christians annoy me a fair amount too. <laughs> um, but also, my family does too. So uh, that's just the reality. There, there's really complex, broken people in the church because that's kind of where we are, and God kind of meets us where we're at. But even if we don't make sense, like Christians don't make sense, look look at who Jesus is. He's really good. He's really worth following when none of the rest of it makes sense. Yeah, thanks so much, mate. It's such a helpful message. Uh, well, until we get to see you again, maybe get you around Australia one day to come and visit all these cool places. It's just been great <laughs> having you on the channel. Yeah, well, thanks for having me too. No worries.
Well, I just want to say a big thanks, everyone making it to this end of the conversation. We really appreciate you connecting here at Questioning Christianity. We really are helping try and connect the Christian story to life's deepest questions. So if you've got any more questions, you can find us at questioningchristianity.com. Submit them, and we're constantly creating new video content, one-minute answers, five- to ten-minute videos, and then these long-form conversations to wrestle with those questions. Uh, check us out over on social media at QC Socials on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. And please do like and subscribe to be able to follow along for more content. Until next time, as always, truth invites questioning. See you later.